Welcome uh, to Fuquay Verena. We appreciate y'all, um, you know, coming down here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, our area and kind of some of the things that we've done or in the process of, of doing. Um, I hate it's such a terrible night uh, for everybody, but uh, maybe we'll try to do a good job and get you out of here and and back where you need to be uh, need to be going to. Um, you know, this topic is one that uh, Fuquay Verena discussed. Uh, I don't know, probably about the time Adam came, about five five years ago, and. Um, it was sort of an intriguing one uh, to us. It had multiple facets that, that we really liked about it. Um, we knew we were going to be experiencing tremendous amount of growth. And in our growth, um, this provides all kind of opportunities uh, and challenges as well, but, but real opportunities. Um, Adam and I, over time, have talked about um, broadband as really being the, the, fifth, the fifth utility. Um, many people are demanding it now. I mean, they don't just, you know, think it's something that's out there. Um, it's part of our economic development package and things that that we've done. We started off in Fuqua Verena just really serving ourselves, uh, our town properties and our town buildings. Um, and now we're using it as part of a, a broader economic uh, development tool. And I think Adam will get into a little more of the details of that. But as I look into the future, you know, where we're going to be five and ten years from now, I think this area is, there is a tremendous need for it. And it's where the, um, the young people, the new tech people are going to be. Uh, and they're the ones that are growing our community. Um, today we were with some people in the downtown area, uh, doing some filming, you know, with the league and, um, many of those businesses now on our main street, uh, expect to have the broadband technology available to them. And it is truly helping change Fuquay Verena. Um, in a area we're in the, the research triangle uh, market and um, many of our citizens really expect this. We've got Ting, I see representatives from Ting here, so I'm sure you'll uh, hear a little more about that. But, you know, in conclusion, I'd say be a good listener to this because this is something that I think uh, will help change our whole region pretty dramatically. Thank you all for being here and thank the League. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Mitchell, and I'm the town manager here in Fuquay Verena, and we appreciate uh, having you all join us here uh, in the lovely town of Fuquay Verena this evening. Uh, hopefully, uh, the rain that you're experiencing when you walked in won't be snow when you walk out this evening, but uh, I, we do hope that everyone finds their way back home safely this evening after this most important uh, presentation and topic of discussion tonight. Uh, the mayor mentioned a little bit uh, about the importance in a broad uh, scope for broadband high-speed connectivity. Uh, for us, our story started with the need to uh, just improve our own business services here in Fuquay Verena. Uh, we uh, believe that it was important to uh, be able to connect our facilities with fiber, with uh, high-speed service, gigabit service, so that we could function better as an organization. Uh, connecting our facilities, providing efficient service, sharing of information uh, internally uh, and externally, and accessing information, uh, whether it's utilities, 
uh, whether it's from the planning and development side, whatever that piece of information might be, uh, efficiencies in government became a, a direct focus of ours. In essence, it was business critical for us. Uh, without uh, connectivity of, of broadband service just to serve ourselves, we didn't feel like we were doing the best uh, that we could for our, our uh, citizens here. Uh, so we, uh, we began to uh, invest ourselves, uh, our elected officials appropriated funds, and we began to put infrastructure in the ground. Um, it was two, two full focus. One was to be able to, um, again, serve our own needs, but second, we were hoping that it would uh, spark the interest of uh, a, a commercial provider to be able to provide service uh, to residents and uh, citizens and businesses in our community. And, in fact, that's, uh, that is uh, what happened. Uh, broadband, uh, as many of you know, it is a critical infrastructure. Uh, it's needed to keep our local economies healthy and thriving. And right now, uh, I think what we find here in Fuquay Verena, at least, is that uh, the big telecoms are not always uh, filling those gaps. And um, what we also find is that uh, the smaller private providers are not necessarily getting the policy support uh, that uh, they need to be able to expand their infrastructure. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that is something that we feel very strongly needs to continue to be supported, uh, both at the state and federal level. Um, you know, a primary function of government is to build our infrastructure networks. Uh, we need to do that so that uh, the, uh, the public can, can work and conduct business and simply live their lives uh, on a daily basis. We have to work uh, closer and stronger to close that digital divide between communities that have access to these services and those that don't have access to these services. Uh, the demand is there, and so it's what do we do uh, in order to uh, supply that need. Um, I'll just, uh, before introducing uh, our next uh, speaker, I'll, I'll, I do want to uh, just leave you with a couple of thoughts. High-speed broadband attracts more capital investment into communities. Uh, there's a number of studies on these. One study reveals substantial differences in economic gross domestic product in communities served by top-line gigabit internet service versus those without gigabit speeds. High-speed broadband has been shown to increase home values and business revenues. Home-based businesses, in fact, uh, see substantially higher revenues when connected to fiber than uh, they do with slower service speeds. And significant investment in fiber to home and gigabit speeds also brings down the cost of lower-tier services, meaning increased availability to everyone. These are all important concepts I hope you take with you as you think about the things that are discussed this evening. Now, with that said, it is my pleasure uh, to introduce a gentleman who was elected uh, mayor of the town of Anger, which happens to be our uh, neighboring, friendly community to the south. Uh, he is a member of the North Carolina League of Municipalities Board of Directors, as well as the North Carolina League of Municipalities Mayors Association. He has focused on a number of issues from across the state, including the most important topic that we're here to discuss tonight, broadband speed service. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce the Honorable Mayor Lou Weatherspoon. Thank you, Adam, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here, and as Mayor Bird and uh, Adam have said, thank you for coming out tonight and, and braving the, the weather. Hopefully, uh, uh, it won't be too bad when we get ready to leave. And, and Adam's right, broadband is something that I'm very interested in and have spoken about quite a lot. Uh, uh, just about a year ago, uh, last March, I stood in the General Assembly as the League of Municipalities released its comprehensive report on this subject called Leaping the Digital Divide. That report, we believe, contains concrete proposals that can help close gaps in broadband access. But as I said at that time, this is really a simple issue for me. As mayor of Anger, I consider bringing jobs and economic growth to my town as a big part of my job description. And as Adam touched on, and I'll just reiterate that, if 
you want jobs to come, if you want business to come, you better have broadband and high-speed internet. We simply cannot do that as effectively without access to fiber, to our homes and also to our businesses. There are a lot of great things going on in Anger and Harnett County. We have a growing, thriving university, Campbell University, just down the road. And for those of you that don't know, Campbell has a medical school among their many other schools. And if you're familiar with uh, telecommuni uh, telecommunications requirements for medical schools, it's, uh, I think it's up to about 10 gigabits now. Uh, up and down is what they're looking for. In Andrew, we have lots of housing growth, but to leverage those great things fully, we need the best internet service possible. We also have 44 strands of fiber running through the town and laid down by a South Carolina firm that helps serve other entities in other areas of the state. A small portion of that is dark fiber, meaning it is not being used. We do not have the ability and the finances at this time to tap into that fiber. We're doing other things in our community to try to create the kind of business growth that we desperately need. We have a business park. We are looking to have a business park with other infrastructure. We want to build a small business incubator also. We have entrepreneurs and home businesses that provide valuable services, just as Adam alluded to. We also have a lot of people that work from home. And in order to work from home, they have to have uh, broadband access, high-speed internet. <clears throat> we need state and federal policies that will encourage all of these entities and all of our people to row the boat that is our economic future in the same direction and not have to push against the current. High-speed broadband and the networks that support it are essential 21st century infrastructure no different than roads or electricity in the 20th century. It is time for all levels of government to realize it as such. Our area is fortunate to be represented by Representatives David Lewis and Larry Strickland and newly elected Senator Jim Bergen. We met with all three just last week on this subject, and I know that they're focused on this issue. And I believe they understand the need to have state policies that encourage innovation solutions, innovative solutions and partnerships. Tonight you will hear about innovative public-private partnerships around the country that are helping communities to leap this divide. You will hear about a very critical need that demonstrated why we cannot sit and wait for the internet that our citizens deserve and require. Finally, this meeting is about engaging with you. So before we conclude, we want to hear from all of you. I want to thank the League of Municipalities and its staff for making this event possible, and I want to thank, thank NC Broadband Matters and the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and its Community Broadband Network Initiative for doing much of the heavy lifting for this meeting. At this time, let me introduce our speaker from the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, which is based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Christopher Mitchell is the director of the Community Broadband Networks Initiative. His work focuses on telecommunications and helping to ensure that communities have reliable broadband networks. He is a leading national expert on community-led broadband networks and speaks at conferences across the United States on this subject. <clears throat> he was honored as one of the 2012 Top 25 in Public se te Sector Technology by Government Technology which honors the top doers, drivers, and dreamers in the nation each year. On a day-to-day -day basis, Chris runs muninetworks.org, a comprehensive online clearinghouse of information that community -led, about community-led broadband. He has published numerous reports on the subject of broadband availability. He earned a master's degree in public policy from the University of Minnesota and a bachelor's degree in political science from McAllister College. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Mitchell. I want to start by thank you for coming out. It's a, 
honor to get on the stage after uh, two mayors and a, and a town manager because um, these local leaders across the country are the ones that are really making a big difference. Um, we see a lot of problems at the state and the federal level, and while those are important and being worked out, it's the mayors and the town managers that are making the, the smart decisions around the country that I think will ultimately lead to policy change at the higher levels that will help us to move forward. And so I'm always excited when an event like this brings out um, attention from local elected officials. I'm deeply appreciative of it. Um, I want to note one other thing, and that's that um, if we do get some snow tonight, I'll be pretty excited because <laughs> Katie and I are lucky enough um, that the snow that was falling when we left Minnesota on Monday morning will still be there on Thursday. <laughs> um, none of it will have melted. <laughs> um, as we're thinking about tonight and what we're going to be talking about, I want to build a foundation and uh, set the stage for what the, the panelists will talk about in their short presentations and the discussion. And that's the kind of internet we want to have um, as we're moving forward. There's actually an event that I go to each year, and the focus is what's the, what's the internet that we want to leave to our children? And, and I think that's what we're driving toward. That's what towns like Fuquay Varina are looking at with their partnerships. It's what Wilson was looking for. It's what uh, cities like Charlotte and, and Raleigh and the, and the whole triangle partnering with, uh, with companies like Google um, and uh, AT&T stepping up to lay fiber with these much higher quality networks that offer abundance in terms of the connectivity. When I want to use a toaster, I don't have to go around the house turning off lights. I have more than, electri more than enough electricity flowing into my house to use whatever appliances I want. I go out to a store and any device that I buy, I'm virtually guaranteed I can take it home. I don't have to worry if it'll plug into the wall and work. I just know that it will because we've provisioned enough electricity for that to happen. That's not the way our broadband networks have worked um, in most places. Um, there are a lot of places in the country now where it, it is the case, where you have more than enough broadband. And that's where, you don't turn off the monitor. Um, that's where, um, actually I'm gonna reorder, reorder these. Um, that's where you look at, it's kinda like being on an interstate that's empty. You're able to do what you need to do. Um, the interstate that's clogged is kind of like the modern networks um, that the, the cable and the telephone companies, the large ones in particular, have focused on. And there's this phrase that gets bandied about sometimes, which is these are companies that are looking to um, sell you as little as possible to keep your business and get as much of your money as possible. Whereas the reverse is what municipal or cooperative broadband is typically more about, which is what's the maximum amount we can give to our businesses and our residents in order to enable innovation, enable really exciting changes while still breaking even. And so as we talk about speeds, I try not to get lost in the, the gigabits, megabits, what's the minimum definition of broadband. Instead, what we need to focus on is having a broadband system that is similar to the electric system, the water system if you're on municipal water, um, you know, the, uh, the natural gas system in which there's simply enough and the prices are reasonable that everyone can access it. So I'll make the case happily that most places are thinking about a gigabit in terms of that. And in North Carolina cities, that's more or less um, common in certain neighborhoods. And in rural areas, it's very uncommon, unless you happen to live in the right parts of North Carolina, which I'll get into. But in the meantime, it's worth noting why most cities have historically gotten involved in this, whether they've done it themselves or whether they've had an explicit partnership with local providers. And that's for economic development. It's very hard to run a town if you're paying, if your businesses have to pay 10, 100 times as much for a necessary input to their business as they would if they lived 10 miles away or 100 miles away. We see tremendous variation across essential broadband prices from community to community that we do not see in other essential utilities. And if a community faced gas prices that were 10 times higher, 20 times higher than a neighboring community, you can bet they would do something about it. And um, in a few cases where that's happened, they actually have. And there are a few municipal gas stations you can find in the United States, um, not by choice. <laughs> like, local governments do what they have to do in order to uh, have their communities thrive. So 
A little bit about us, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. We've been around for 45 years. Our fundamental belief is that communities should be able to make the decisions that uh, will allow them to thrive. Uh, we focus on both political and economic power, which I, as soon as I start saying that, I always think I'm starting to lose people. But fundamentally, it's the idea that if something's going to impact your life, you should have a say in it. And we worry about this when it comes to heavy-handed decision-making coming out of D.C., even if we're kind of in favor of it. Philosophically, we're always worried about um, that level of representation because there's so few people representing so many people. Whereas at the local level, when a decision's made, you can bet the mayor will notice um, if there are, is a lot of discontent. Even if it's a really good decision, <laughs> he, still, he or she will still hear about it. And it's still a, a level of government in which going out with a message that may not resonate with funders, but going to enough doors can make a difference. And so we fundamentally want to see local political power and localities that have the authority to be able to make decisions that matter. One of the things they need in order to do that is to have local economic power. Because if all of your stores are run by companies headquartered in other states, it's difficult to have the kind of economic power you need to make the political decisions you may want to make. Because um, where the money goes tends to call the shots. So I want to talk about electrification a little bit. Because one of the things that I hope that everyone will walk out of this room understanding is that we are going to get high quality broadband out to everyone. We electrified everyone in the country. We brought phone service to everyone in the country during times that were more challenging than this, um, with technologies that were more expensive than this, and we are going to solve this problem. What I'm here tonight to try and move us toward is making sure that we do it more rapidly than, um, than in a shorter time period. Um, I think we can do it in seven years if we really put our, uh, our heads together and worked hard at it. Otherwise, I think 20 or 30 years. It's hard for me to imagine that in 30 years, people living with grid electricity will not have high quality broadband. That's the direction that we're going in. And so I look back and, and I look at the, um, what I think is possibly one of the best government policies of all time, the Rural Electrification Administration, not just in times of the uh, remarkable changes uh, to the society, the quality of life, but to the fact of such an elegantly designed program, such a, a minimal cost to the taxpayer um, relative to the tremendous benefits it brings. But I think what a lot of people don't realize is that if you were living during that time, a lot of cities, I mean, like Wilson established its electric utility, I want to say in like 1889 or something like that. Um, you know, the light bulb hadn't been around for that long. Electrification happened in 1935. For a lot of us, when we're reading a textbook about history, I think it's sort of like, oh, there was a short period of time where people didn't have electricity, and then everyone had it 50, 60 years later. We're in that period right now where it's really frustrating, but we are going to come out the other side, and I hope we can learn some key lessons. But if you go back and you look at the arguments that were happening then, it's the exact same arguments that we hear today. Um, there's a terrific book that was published in like 1979 by a professor out of Texas named Brown. And, and it's amazing to hear these arguments because they say things like, well, if people in the rural areas needed electricity, we, the big private electric companies, would have built it to them because we want to have as many customers as possible. And it's just the case that there's no business model that will justify building electricity out to the people we haven't connected yet. Um, this is incidentally why farms on the west of the country were are largely electrified early in the 1900s because they were very, um, they needed pumps to pull the water out of the ground to be able to irrigate. And so there was a business case there. In the Midwest where I'm from, you see a lot of co-ops now because they didn't have a business case until the federal government came along and changed the equation. So that's what we're looking at today, whether it's uh, local governments proving the way and then the federal government hopefully eventually catching up and really making it easier on the local governments to make it happen. The electric cooperatives and the telephone cooperatives that were built between 50 and 80 years ago have done a tremendous amount of work that is underappreciated in terms of already bringing high quality connectivity across America. The Dakotas come in um, always in the top five of the fastest broadband states. It's crazy to think about that. And in fact, one of the, um, who was it last night? Um, Owen, the, the gentleman who does technology for the city of Albemarle, where we were last night, he grew up in western North Dakota. And he said that on Twitter, because he was retweeting some of the stuff, people in North Dakota were saying, wait, 
Broadband's a problem? We've had fiber here for 10 years, for 12 years. And, and they were sort of surprised that people in the United States don't have high quality access. So this is just a sign it can be done, it will be done. In fact, it's been done to a larger extent than you may realize. Um, rural areas are not a, a wasteland for broadband. In many cases, um, not in most cases, but you can find better broadband than you can get, I would say, in Charlotte. Um, because it's going to be at a lower rate with good local customer service that you can't always get even in the bigger cities. You can find that in a lot of rural areas. Ten miles away, they might not have anything. So those are the gaps we're going to be dealing with. Um, we did a map of where uh, money from the federal Connect America Fund program is coming from and coming into the region because our hope is that, I don't know where you're all from, but I'm guessing some of you are from outside the city limits where you're hoping to get better access in um, coming um, years. Possibly you're within city limits and, and worried about getting better access. But I wanted to show that in these regions, there's a lot of money from the federal government that is going to the, uh, what we call the legacy providers, the telephone companies um, that have, were the ones to establish telephone service. Our argument is that that money has not been very wisely spent, um, that it should be going to more innovative companies, to cooperatives that have a stronger incentive to provide better service. But it's a reminder that as we talk about bringing broadband to everyone, it doesn't even necessarily need to be new money. It's redirecting money that has already been, that's already being spent. There's not a lot of new money that is needed to really solve this problem. There is a, um, a model for communities where local governments are prohibited or um, strongly discouraged from offering broadband services themselves. Um, a model that comes from this community in Minnesota which um, has about 8,000 households spread out over about 650 square miles. It's an area with, um, with uh, about eight towns. The largest one's like 2,500. The, most of them are less than 1,000 people um, are in that neighborhood. And they wanted to build a municipal network. They just couldn't make the economics work out the way they wanted to. They ended up creating a co-op with a very interesting financing arrangement. But it took them about six years and that's one of the points I wanted to make is that when you have local organizing, you need to be prepared to work, um, uh, work through challenges. There's a, a movie from the 90s that my sister and I loved called The Replacements. I'm pretty sure it was late 90s with um, um, Keanu Reeves playing a, a washed up quarterback. And um, the, um, Gene Hackman's a coach and he says, do you know what separates the winners from the losers? And Keanu Reeves says, the score, coach, which is... Brilliant. <laughs> um, as, a, as a former jock, I, I love that. Um, and Gene Hackman says, no, it's getting back up on the horse after you've fallen off and been kicked in the teeth. And that's, that's really the difference of where we see really good broadband being developed. In some cases, if you happen to live in an area that has a co-op that's making really good investments, then you've hit the jackpot. Most places are going to have to find some way to incent a provider to come in and to make it happen. So um, one of the lessons that we've seen is that the places that succeed, it's where the plan A fell apart, and they came up with a plan B, and maybe that worked a little bit, but they had to modify it and go to plan C, but they kept working at it because it was important for them to make sure that their children could come back home after they went off to college, to make sure that they were attracting new businesses and that sort of a thing. So this is difficult. There are about 500 communities around the nation that have built their own networks. Uh, Wilson, Salisbury, um, there's a few other older ones like Morganton um, in North Carolina, but the state has made it all but impossible to build new ones. What we're hoping to see from the state will be an opening where cities would be able to have some freedom to partner with companies um, like Ting, like the cooperatives that we'll hear from one, like um, Open Broadband who we'll hear from in a minute. Um, or other entities that are available. We've highlighted a few, but there are opportunities like this. We want to make sure that cities have the authority in North Carolina to engage in these kinds of partnerships um, that are relatively low risk in order to make sure that the communities can, can uh, thrive. We did a case study on Wilson. I just want to note that when I go around the country, I always talk about whatever local municipal networks are there, but I often also talk about Wilson. They have done a tremendous job of making sure the entire community benefits. They have specific programs that we brag about across the country trying to, trying to have them duplicated to make sure that low-income families can uh, access it, to make sure that working-class families who have the money but have bad credit, that they can access it. 
they've gone out of their way to really make sure they have the kind of services that world-class banking needs to keep them in the, in the community. And so um, I think Wilson doesn't get enough credit, and they've done a tremendous job, and I always want to highlight what they've done. Um, there are other models that I think are really exciting for areas in which you have homeowners who would be willing to um, amortize uh, the debt of connecting their homes to a better network over 20 years. We're talking about a cost of uh, well, well under what it costs to extend water to a home, but amortized over 20 years, um, you're looking at a payment of between $10 and $20 for thousands of dollars of cost. Um, so $10 or $20 a month tacked on to a broadband bill of $50 or $60. From what we can tell, most Americans would love to have that deal. This community in Idaho, Ammon, Idaho, They've figured out a really innovative model that's going to, we believe, is going to start sweeping the nation. We're going to see hopefully 10 to 15 communities embracing that this year. But there's a video about it and how it plays in, into public safety and that sort of thing that, um, that I, I love to highlight. Um, places like, I know Holly Springs um, here and, um, and Fuquay Arena have worked with, with Ting um, in the manner of making them access to dark fiber and conduit. And this is a policy which is a, a no-brainer in terms of cities should be planning ahead to make sure that they are putting this infrastructure in the ground and then most importantly, making it accessible to potential partners without it being very complicated. I'm going to go a little bit over time, I realize. Um, but it's worth noting, I, um, I work with a small provider in Minneapolis, and they went to a neighboring community and said, we want to get from point A to point B. And that community came back with two pages and said, we have conduit, here's the price, here are the terms, this is where you sign, boom, happy to have it done. We went to my city, which I love, which does not have very good broadband, <laughs> and, and we went to speak with the CIO, and he said, oh yeah, we have some conduit, you know, just make us an offer of what you want, I'll come back to you, we'll negotiate, we'll take it to city council, they'll negotiate, you know, we'll work something out, it'll just take five or six months. That's not going to work. <laughs> and so it's important not just to make these policies that you're having the conduit on the ground, but then to take the next step of making sure you have an accessible agreement to work on the terms of these nimble companies. And we created a map of North Carolina as I'm finishing up my presentation here. I wanted to end by noting that cooperatives have done a wonderful job in North Carolina. I frequently say that we don't really have a rural broadband problem in this country. We have a problem with, with several, we're talking about five or six very large telephone companies who do not have the incentive or the capacity to invest in rural America. I think that is totally acceptable. And I do not blame companies like AT&T, Windstream, CenturyLink, Frontier, um, there's a few others, Verizon, who's not relevant in this month so much. But I don't blame them for not being able to invest and solve this problem in rural America because it's very challenging for a company that's, that's designed the way they are to respond to short-term shareholder interest to do it. I do get frustrated when they try to stop other people from doing it. So that's where I hope we can, fr we can focus our anger to the extent we have it because they are not the logical solution to this. Cooperatives like we're going to hear from shortly and more innovative companies that want to that invest in these local communities are a better answer and policy should be reflecting that. Um, this is just a reminder that we have hope, <laughs> that this problem is not as hard as you thought it was coming through the door. With the right policies, we're going to get it done. Tonight we'll talk about some of those. We're going to have a Q&A, and we're going to talk about, um, well, we're going to talk about a number of different things in the panel. We're going to have a Q&A where we encourage you to either ask questions or to come up and tell us a story about why broadband is important to you, how it has impacted you, maybe a frustration that you have or something like that, so we can answer your questions, but also we can take some of those stories back to Raleigh, back to Washington, D.C., when we're talking to folks to make sure that they're hearing from people. So that's the end of my presentation. We want to make sure people understand there's some resources here, some folders we put together with, with other resources um, and information. We have a survey that at the end I'll put up again that I'd love for people to take at the end just to see if we're answering the right questions and that sort of a thing. And before I bring the panel, the first panelist up, I want to thank our sponsors. Um, I want to thank the North Carolina League of Municipalities, um, who was really uh, a co-conspirator in terms of just thinking about this idea of having these, these meetings. 
and who I've been inspired by, by all the work that you've done to um, prioritize broadband and better broadband access. So I thank you, Aaron. I thank the um, uh, mayors who have served on the board or are serving on the board. Um, this is um, North Carolina's League of Municipalities is doing more on broadband than any other league that I'm aware of um, in the country um, at the state level. So um, Aaron's work is putting this together is, was very helpful. Um, you know, Alan and the team from NC Hearts Gigabit, um, Catherine Rice, someone that I've worked with, I think you should stand up for a second. So one of the first people I met when I started working this business back, <laughs> a, a tireless advocate for improving broadband across North Carolina. Um, who's just a, a wonderful, caring person. Um, and then um, Ting, a company that I have known for a very long time. In fact, before they started doing fiber networks, before they did wireless networks, I was familiar with them. I just so appreciate that Ting does a lot of work behind the scenes to make the internet work, serving on committees that are joyless, that actually kind of suck the life out of you. Um, they, they do the hard work to make sure the internet works for all of us in fighting for policies, and then building networks that we all can appreciate. And so I love that Ting is here. The first time I heard Fuquay Verena, um, a lot of people were laughing about how to pronounce it. I happened to be with some folks um, who are from North Carolina when the announcement was made about Ting, and, uh, and they were just excited that Ting got the pronunciation right at the event. <laughs> um, so I, um, I really appreciate Ting um, supporting this event, making it happen, and, and really being willing to experiment with cities that have the authority um, to partner. Um, Ting's working in a number of different states, and, and I know from personal conversations with them that North Carolina law makes it more difficult to work here, and I do not think that's what uh, we should have um, in place. We should be encouraging companies like Ting to be investing more. So with that, let me bring up our first panelist for a five-minute presentation, um, Jeff Brooks, the managing consultant of ECC Technologies, is not the first person coming up. <laughs> we listed people in the wrong order. The first person is John Coggin, the Director of Ag Advocacy for um, the North Carolina Rural Center and someone who's traveled around the state talking to folks about um, what's happening in rural North Carolina, what their needs are and that sort of thing. So John, please kick us off. Thank you very much. Well, Jeff, I feel like you should come up here and say <laughs> Well, before we get started, I am just curious. I know a lot of the folks in the room, but I'm curious who is in the room. Um, if you are an elected official or an employee, a, a staff person of a local government, could you raise your hand? Awesome. A lot of those folks in the room. Uh, if you're with an Internet service provider. Okay. If you're with a nonprofit or state group that's, that's in the fight to, to help uh, get broadband out. Okay. That's great. Well, especially to the local government folks, but to everybody in the room, the one thing that I want to say um, before I get into any detail is you don't have to do it alone. This is the economic development issue of our time, and I don't walk into a room anywhere in North Carolina without having people who are ready to roll up their sleeves and get to work on this. So the job is big, as we showed. Uh, the, the rural cooperatives are doing an amazing job. Uh, there's still a lot of white places on that map that aren't served, um, but it's not just in your hands. There's a lot of people who want to work together on this. Um, I know this because I have been around the state um, with the Rural Center. If you're not familiar with us, we are an uh, independent private nonprofit, the Rural Center. We serve 80 of the 100 rural counties, and we get to that by a population density metric at our county level. So any county that has fewer than 250 people per square mile, we consider as rural. Um, we've been around for over 30 years. Um, you might be familiar with us for our lending work for small businesses. You might be uh, familiar with this, at least one for a person. Matt, I know, is a graduate of our Ready, our uh, Rural Economic Development Institute, which is a leadership training program, which has been going on for almost 30 years. But about three years ago, in 2016, we launched Rural Counts, which is an advocacy program focused on comprehensive economic development in our rural areas. And so the first thing we did when we launched that program uh, because we didn't want to be one of those groups that sort of sits in an office in Raleigh and then hires a team of lobbyists to go and do what we think needs to be done in the state. We wanted to get 
into communities and figure out exactly what we needed to be doing. So we took this 10-point strategy, everything from education to healthcare to manufacturing, agriculture, physical infrastructure, and yes, broadband, and we hosted local community conversations with leaders in every single one of the 80 counties that we serve. My president, Patrick Woody, and I traveled 8,457 miles, not that we were counting or anything, um, and we met with folks uh, cross-sector, across this uh, wonderful state. I know where the best barbecue and the best margaritas are, but we can talk about that after this. Um, and everywhere we went, um, lot, several issues came up. Um, and I have um, one of the handouts here is, is our advocacy priorities. Across the state, we heard about a need for supporting small business. We heard about a need for um, expanding access to rural health care. But above all, broadband rose to the top every single place we went. And I say it's the economic development imperative of our time because I started that journey with the line that there is no silver bullet. There's not one thing we can do to solve all of our problems. Even if we invested everything in education, there's still gonna be some issues. Even if we did everything in job development or infrastructure, that's not gonna solve everything. And I still believe that, but there's no issue that comes closer to being that silver bullet than getting uh, quality internet in our communities. You see it in education. We are the first state in the country to get high-speed internet to all of our public school systems, and we should celebrate that. But in this century, if there's a student that has access to internet at school and then goes home and doesn't have access, those benefits fall off real quickly. In healthcare, we work with the North Carolina Institute for Agri-Medicine that goes out and does screenings with farm workers and fishermen across our state. And if they had access to telemedicine, to be able to not just, to be able to take a, a, a sign of high blood pressure or diabetes and get someone connected with a doctor via an iPhone or an uh, iPad right there, we could help save lives with internet. If we um, had internet in our rural communities, we would be better able to, as we said earlier, the mayor and, uh, and, and Adam both said, about recruiting firms, getting people to come back home and stay home. Um, you know, it's interesting, we talk a lot um, about um, brain drain in our rural areas. And it's true, about every single one of our rural communities loses 20 to 30 year olds. And I would wager that no matter where you grow up, even if it's in New York City, you're probably gonna wanna get away from home for a while. And that's probably good. We want our youth and our young people to see the world and get experiences uh, in a wide variety of places. But over half of our rural counties, and that's also true across the United States, are seeing a net increase in 30 to 40 year olds. But in order to see that net increase, we have got to have access to broadband infrastructure along with several other pieces of infrastructure. But that is at the top of most young people's list. If they're gonna come back and work for a company in London or start their own firm, they're gonna need high speed internet. And we heard that across the state. Um, and so in all of these different areas, and uh, we have heard that there are people ready to work together to provide internet and see how it affects all these different varieties of, um, of, of our areas of life. So I want to say, I, we're happy to get into policy when we get into the Q&A. We have policies that we think matter. We are really excited that last year the General Assembly passed the great program, the Growing Rural Economies with Access to Technology, which did a pilot program to help match private investments um, in areas that are underserved right now, and we're really excited. February 1st, I think, is the um, deadline for those that first round of grants, and we really hope to see some underserved areas get served with that. But that's just one of a multitude of things we need to do at the state and federal level to make sure that we are meeting this challenge of our time. Um, I'll end with um, an example of how you can walk into rooms and not really understand uh, the, how this issue affects people, and then you walk out of the room amazed at who you can get on your side for this issue. I am a part of a healthy retail task force. Um, it's, it's a really great group, diverse group of folks with the, the imperative of getting more healthy food 
into our rural areas and underserved urban areas by incentivizing retailers. So grocery stores or other ways, uh, other means of, of getting healthy food into communities. And we've been meeting for a few months now, had a couple of meetings, and this is one meeting, you know, people get on my case for talking about broadband all the time, but I felt that this was one meeting where I could really just talk about supply chain and, and healthy foods and retailing, and I didn't really need to bring broadband into the conversation. Well, we get to the end of our time together, and we're sort of thinking about finalizing, putting the last words on some policy recommendations, when a grocer speaks up. And he says, you know, we've been talking all the time about brick and mortar stores in areas that are underserved. But you know what? I've already invested a ton of money into the next generation of my business, which is getting food out to people through home delivery services. We're already seeing with Amazon, IGA, I, I don't mean to, I hope that's not privileged information, but they're who said, we're already invested in that. The next generation is going to be getting food directly to homes. We don't necessarily have to have brick and mortar in every community. Um, but if people don't have internet at home, they're not going to be able to order that food. So suddenly, the conversation changed <laughs> into how do we have broadband policy to support healthy food retailers across North Carolina. And now I'm talking with public health folks who have never even thought about gigabit, uh, who are coming to me saying, how do we, how do we get versant on uh, broadband policy in order to get this done. So I know it's a big challenge and it's a persistent challenge. And a lot of times it seems as if uh, the powers that be are really working against finding a solution for this. But what I'll say now, and we can get into specifics later to you, is there are always people and there are a multitude of people if you just sit and ask them how broadband affects their life, that they are ready to work with us on these solutions, so it is not just on your shoulders. So I hope with that, even if without the weather, you can breathe easy with that. So I'll leave. The second member of our panelist is also the honored guest on the uh, famous Community Broadband Bits podcast, <laughs> which has a very loyal, loyal, loyal listenership in the low hundreds. So be one of the few. Alan, Alan Fitzpatrick, co-founder of, of uh, NC Hertz Gigabit and uh, CEO of Open Broadband. Uh, we just did an interview last night that's going to be posted in the next day or so. So I look forward to hearing your comments. Well, thanks for having me up here tonight. Uh, Alan Fitzpatrick uh, from Waxhaw, North Carolina. Anybody know where Waxhaw is? Yeah, all right, excellent, just south of Charlotte. So uh, I'm going to talk briefly about NC Hearts Gigabit, and then I'm going to talk about our company, Open Broadband, and ways we're helping uh, try to uh, resolve this problem of access of broadband in the rural areas. So NC Hearts Gigabit is part of a nonprofit project uh, under NC Broadband Matters, uh, Deb and uh, Catherine are also board members with me. Uh, we actually kind of started this initiative five years ago in Charlotte with an, an initiative called Charlotte Hearts Gigabit. And the idea at the time was to encourage Google Fiber to pick Charlotte as a city. And Raleigh was obviously going through the same uh, process here, and Google Fiber said yes, and then both cities got uh, announced. So we, we felt very good that we were able to attract a broadband fiber provider to Charlotte at the time. Uh, so our mission now as a nonprofit is really to promote high-speed internet, uh, fiber access, gigabit access uh, throughout all of North Carolina. Uh, we held an interactive event at the Rural Center. Uh, thank you, John, for, uh, for hosting us. Uh, last year, we're doing another one this year, April 26th. So we're going to send out some more information on that. We hope you can attend. We had 150 people, I think, show up last time. We talked about how do you finance these ventures? Uh, you know, how do you encourage access uh, for more people? Uh, a lot of uh, uh, great topics and great conversations. We hope you can make it. Uh, so with that, I'm going to shift it over to uh, Open Broadband. Uh, so I'm the CEO and founder of the company. Uh, when we started this company, we looked at this data from the FCC. I've got lots of pictures, by the way, so, so you don't just have to stare at me. We looked at this data and saw that 30% of the census tracts in the country did not have access to a broadband provider. Broadband being defined as 25 megabits by 3 megabits, according to the FCC. 48% of the census tracts only have access to one. And that's where I live in Waxhaw. I can get cable. Cable is my only broadband choice, but at least I have one. 
but there's no competition. So 78% of the country really has no choice in their broadband. So uh, I've been in the industry for quite a while and said, uh, I know how to set up an internet company. Why don't we go solve this problem to the extent that we, we can? So we built a network, and it all starts with a data center. Uh, I came from the data center world. Uh, we have a data center in Charlotte. We have access to 12 fiber providers, including Spirit, which goes through some of your towns. Uh, we lease fiber circuits out to communities, and then in the local communities, we tend to do a fixed wireless last mile. So some people refer to us as a WISP, a wireless internet provider. We like to think of ourselves as a hybrid. Yes, we do wireless, but we're also data center centric and we're very fiber centric. Uh, you have to have fiber to do wireless. You gotta have that transport to take the traffic. Fiber is every bit as important as the wireless last mile. But uh, as an example of this, we're serving the town of Mount Olive from the Charlotte Data Center, leasing a fiber circuit to the water towers on Mount Olive, and I've got a picture of them in just a minute, and we're providing high-speed internet to those that didn't have it before. Our method is to do public-private partnerships. So if you're a town or a county and you're sick and tired of what you're getting and you want something better, uh, we'd like to partner with you to roll out high-speed service. Uh, we tend to respond to RFIs and RFPs, so we have one in Benson that several of us are probably gonna respond to. Uh, we were chosen in Orange County, so we have a large project there to go into the underserved portions of Orange County, not Hillsborough and Chapel Hill, but Cedar Grove, Rougemont, Hurdle Mills. You guys know where those places are? The rural areas of the, of the area, right? Uh, we're talking to Chatham County as well. Northern Chatham County is really suffering for lack of uh, broadband. Uh, we're live in Belmont, we're live, live in Mount Olive. Uh, we were chosen by Wayne County. Duplin County just sort of tugged the pull, <laughs> tugged on the strings, and we're now live in Calypso and Faison. Uh, we're getting pulled in so many different directions, but it's a good thing. We're expanding our, our network. Uh, in addition to providing service to residential uh, and businesses, uh, we do things like downtown Wi-Fi zones. Uh, Andrew, of course, is doing one. I think Benson uh, rolled out a downtown Wi-Fi zone. We did one in Belmont, so you walk up and down the streets, and you're on free, free internet. Uh, our last mile that I mentioned is fixed wireless. Uh, we tend to use uh, water towers and communication towers. So this is a picture of our installation in Mount Olive. You can see the mast from a distance on the left and on the right is a close up. We put a lot of antennas on this mast. Uh, but we are serving the airport, we're serving University of Mount Olive, we're serving the town. All the town buildings are now on our internet. Believe it or not, the airport was running off of DSL four megabit DSL for the airport. They had a quote for $100,000 to bring in fiber. They didn't have the budget. We said, we can just do a little wireless 100 megabit pipe and we won't charge you anything up front. We'll just charge you for the service. How about that? So they took us up on it. Uh, our model is we like to go in with very affordable rates. So we start off service at $40. Uh, we have not found that to be an issue even in the lower income areas. We provide service starting at 25 megabits. We don't believe we should do anything less than broadband. We can provide gigabit. We can provide gigabit on fiber. We can do it wirelessly as well. The technology exists uh, to do that. Uh, we serve basically every type of business. We are completely North Carolina owned and operated. Our call center is in Wilson. So when our customers have a problem, they're talking to a North Carolinian who understands what they're going through. A few of our customers, Pfeiffer University, University of Mount Olive, the ones you see on the screen, the airport. Charlotte Housing Authority, I'll mention in just a minute. We do some public housing uh, broadband service. The antenna that goes on the user uh, side is about the size of a dinner plate. These are not big satellite dishes. So these are just some of the pictures. The one on the upper left is a gigabit antenna. Uh, it's from a company called IgniteNet. So we're delivering gigabit up and down to an orthodontist. So when they do the Invisalign scans of the mouth and they get this huge 3D imaging file, they can now upload it in less than a minute. It used to take them 40 minutes, uh, if you're orthodontist. Airport is in the lower left, some of the other clients that you can see. Uh, we're also very uh, supportive of entrepreneurs. We're entrepreneurs ourselves. We like to support entrepreneurship centers. If you want to drive entrepreneurship in your community, we would love to help. So uh, we provide the internet service to Packer Place and Uptown Charlotte. Uh, we also provide 
free public Wi-Fi off the roof into Ramir Bearden Park, if you're familiar with Charlotte. Uh, on the right side, uh, we have uh, turned up uh, fiber service to TechWorks, which is a new uh, innovation center in Belmont, and we're also doing all the uh, Wi-Fi there as well. And we're getting ready to roll out Tabris, which is another co-working facility in Charlotte uh, on South Boulevard. Um, again, gigabit fiber plus high-speed wireless. Uh, we serve residential in a variety of uh, fashions. These are our installs. Uh, what you're seeing here is Duplin County and Wayne County and Lee County. The two on the right are from a neighborhood in Lee County where we partnered with Conterra Broadband to access their fiber. And then we did a wireless distribution into the neighborhood. And you can see the antennas aren't that obnoxious, I guess. <laughs> they, you know, they, they sort of blend in. At least we like to think so. Uh, the Wi-Fi zones, we tend to uh, define an area along the public streets where you want to have service for a town. Uh, we'll also do uh, campuses and parks. So on the left is Pfeiffer University's campus in Meisenheimer in Stanley County, uh, where we cover the entire ball field, soccer, tennis courts, uh, baseball fields. Uh, everybody has free public Wi-Fi. On the right is the Bryan Sports Complex in Goldsboro, which also has free internet. Uh, this is our public housing community in Charlotte, uh, Dillahay Courts. Uh, we just turned this up about six months uh, or so ago. Every resident in the public housing has free access to broadband. Everyone. They don't have to qualify for the SNAP program. In this case, the city is actually paying uh, for the service. We've got to figure out how it's going to be paid for long term. Uh, but the residents themselves are not paying for it. So we set up these Wi-Fi zones in those uh, green circles you can see. So we're covering the entire footprint. And in order to get on the Internet, it's just picking the Wi-Fi on your phone or your laptop or your TV. And we have seen Xboxes on it, too. So it's not just being used for education. Uh, one thing we're really excited about is our plan for Stanley County. And the audience last night was really excited about this. I won't spend a lot of time on it now because I'm probably running out of time. We are putting in a gigabit wireless network in Stanley County where we're connecting uh, the, the dots. You see the four blue dots are the county towers. So we signed an agreement with the county to get on those towers and provide gigabit uh, access. The two yellow are the Stanley County Airport and Pfeiffer University that wanted gigabit links. And the blue larger circles you see around the dots, that's going to be residential service for broadband. So we're going to use this ring to serve the government, the airport, the anchor institutions, and residents and get everybody faster speed. Uh, and I'll just close with this one. Uh, so our mission was to try to solve that problem where there wasn't broadband option. And these are the results. We tend to go into areas that are stuck with DSL and satellite and give them broadband speed. We'll do custom things like Wi-Fi zones. We'll do gigabit whenever we can do it. We'd like to go uh, help entrepreneurs. And the very last bullet is one of my favorites. You keep incumbents honest, right? I always love the Google Fiber effect. So uh, living in the Charlotte area, until Google Fiber announced that they were coming, AT&T didn't offer fiber. Spectrum was like 60 megabit service. Well, as soon as Google Fiber came to town, AT&T goes, wait, wait a minute, we can do that too. Um, and then Spectrum goes, oh, wait a minute, we can up your speed to 300 meg for no difference in price. It's like, really? Well, why didn't you do that before? You didn't do it until Google came. Uh, so that raised the bar, right? Google Fiber came in and raised the bar. So what we're trying to do is if we go into an area, provide faster speeds, we're hopeful that the incumbents will also offer faster speeds. Everybody wins. So thanks for your time. <laughs> So I would like to reintroduce Jeff Brooks, a managing consultant with ECC Technologies, uh, someone who's working with a variety of communities to help them find solutions that work for them. Please come on up. Thank you. Is that all right? Yes. All right. So um, I'm a native of North Carolina, uh, undergrad at East Carolina Graduate School, NC State. Both my children graduate NC State. 
I live about three miles from here. Uh, my father-in-law, uh, all my in-laws are from here, the Whitakers and the Adams right down 401, the Rawls is down 401 in the other direction, the Blaylocks scattered all around. My father-in-law built custom homes here in Raleigh for many years, including some up and down 401. He always complained, why isn't there any growth in Southwest Raleigh? Because he always had to go out north when he was building. And obviously that has changed a little bit. I remember Raleigh when there was no I-40, when Tryon Road was two lanes all the way around. Uh, a lot of changes since that point in time. Uh, from a kind of a personal, professional perspective, um, I worked in public accounting in downtown Raleigh for Ernst & Winnie, was on tax staff, went to work for Data General, which is also in Clayton and Apex. But I worked in RTP writing accounting software for about three weeks, and they decided I should do something else, and that was deal with real people in the real world and convince them to buy big computer systems. Long story short, I ended up working for one of my clients, a startup cell phone company in Greensboro, North Carolina. I was the ninth employee there. Uh, within five years, we had gone from uh, nine employees to, uh, geez, I think we were about 1,200, about $200 million in revenue, bought out by AT&T. I went to the Southern Company in Atlanta after saying I would never live in Atlanta, and I built out their wireless system for Alabama Power, Georgia Power, Gulf Power, and uh, Mississippi Power. Worked for GT, ran their national wireless program, and then worked for Bell South, advising the chairman's organization in terms of what's coming down the road from a competitive technology perspective. Got tired of that. Started doing small startups. Ended up building nine or ten wireless systems in the southeast, focused on fixed wireless. About three years ago, a friend of mine said, you really ought to come and talk to ECC. What's going on with ECC? Met the folks at ECC. Found out that they had built fiber for the past 15 years in over 200 counties in the United States had worked with more than 100 co-ops, had extensive amounts of experience in doing the things that we're talking about tonight. So it kind of, in these conversations, got me interested in what ECC and the co-ops were all about, and I found out pretty quickly. I met a man named Curtis Wynn, who was the CEO of Roanoke Electric. And so what began to happen is with them as one of our clients, and probably my favorite client, I began making the trek about once or twice a week up 64, generally to Tarboro, Highway 258 or 111, and I'd work my way over to Pahoski, which is where Roanoke's headquarters is at. So rather than talk about megabits and schmegabits and gigabits and all that, because uh, the speaker before me and the speaker after me will tell you all about the advantages and the capabilities of infrastructure, I'd rather kind of talk about what John talked about, but from a little bit different perspective, if you'll bear with me for a few minutes. Because at Roanoke, the company built a 210-mile fiber backbone to enable communications between itself and its substations to control and manage the flow and the delivery of power. Curtis Swin had a little bit better idea. Because in the five counties in northeastern North Carolina, we're served by Roanoke, some of the poorest counties in our state. I'm not a native North Carolinian. I love this state. But I grew up on food stamps and child support. I had holes in the floor of my house. I had ice on my toilet in the winter. I have a whole lot of empathy for the people that I see when my little VW and I ride up and down the road. These are our fellow citizens. Think about the fact I have this type 2 diabetes that may be TMI, but when I go to the endocrinologist, it's $300 to walk in the door. My lab work is $750. That's every quarter. You now find yourself in all over North Carolina, and let's say you're lucky and you're making $15 an hour. After taxes, that's $10 an hour. What do you do if you're going to go to the doctor? You're going to take off work, and it's going to cost you 15 hours of work. No, 30 hours. Can't do math that quick. And, pardon? 30, 30, 30 hours worth of work to pay to go to the doctor. Montre Freeman, who's a city manager in Enfield, North Carolina, says his city has the highest rate of amputations in the state. Could it be because people can't afford to make that choice of do I work or do I go to the doctor? So Curtis Wynn says, maybe I can help out people in the pocketbook. Do Power comes along to all the co-ops and they say, we're going to raise your rates to clean up coal ash. So consequently, co-ops have to come along <laughs> Co-ops have to come along. Is that better? Yeah. 
And they have to raise their rates for the people that can least afford it. And Curtis says, wait a minute, I got an idea. What if we put an Ecobee thermostat in everybody's home and we tweak their settings just a little bit whenever we were going to pay peak power prices, which are exorbitantly high? And what if we tweak their water heater just a little bit? I'll bet we could save our average homeowner $240 a year. Had to have broadband to do it. Fiber to the home for 11,000 customers was $110 million. Thought about, well, think about what these gentlemen are talking about. Fiber backbone, we've got it. Let's do fixed wireless. Started that last June. We have over 200 subscribers on. We'll, at the end of this year, we'll pass 4,000 homes. We'll probably have, I'm going to say probably 1,500 Internet subscribers, probably 2,000 people on the smart grid, and access for telehealth with Vida and East Carolina University for every one of those broadband subscribers at no charge. Reason why is because Cambion, who's our vendor, said, you know what? If you have somebody that fits the economic profile, we'll provide the subscriber equipment for home health care, for telemedicine. So... The lady that's 92 years old that's in that little single wide, or the little family over here where the roof is falling in right outside of a rich square, all of a sudden they've got a little something they didn't have before. But now, from a governmental perspective, there's something else. People in rural America are worried about depopulation. I think that's the fancy word. It means folks moving out, like we've discussed here tonight. They're worried about economic disenfranchisement. People move out, jobs go away, the tax base is less we can afford as a government to do fewer things for our citizens. So I was on an economic development call the other day with a guy that was saying, hey, I'd like to bring 25 jobs to Rich Square. If you've ever been to Rich Square, it's like many towns you know about, it, it's tough. 25 jobs is a big deal. What's interesting, the 25 jobs paid $85,000. Guy wanted to bring a server farm. 10,000 servers. 100,000 square feet, a new substation for the co-op. To trickle down from those new jobs that were coming in, it was probably going to create another 40 jobs. Requirement, can you have gigabit internet for me two weeks from when I close on the building? Absolutely. We're doing 2.5 gig right now wirelessly. And you sit one mile off my fiber ring, I can have aerial fiber there in four weeks. I can give you diverse circuits. In Durham, there's a company that's called Eight Rivers Networks. Right now, they're doing terabit, I'm sorry, terahertz wireless right here in Durham. All light, no wires, one gig right now live in Durham. There are different ways to skin this cat, but this is the last point I want to leave, and I thank you guys for letting me spend a minute or two to get a little bit passionate here, but this is just really important. Whenever you're talking with your service providers, what I would ask is that you put yourself in their shoes for a moment. Because a lot of what we do at ECC, we don't just design fiber and deploy it and introduce people to service providers and things like that. We also think in terms of what does the partnership look like? Understand what your providers are paying in order to serve you. What does it cost to be on a tower? What does it cost to build a tower? What does it cost to run that mile of fiber, strand and lash, or ADSS? What does it cost? And then work with them, as Christopher said early on, what does that payback period look like? So that the lady that's 92 years old that wants to FaceTime with her children that moved off somewhere can do it. That this man over here that's got the diabetes, that they can sit there and actually plug him up. And it, I think we're averaging about 60 megabit right now in our network. You've got FaceTime with the physician real-time monitoring instrumentation, real-time download of stored in, 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 instrumented stuff, data. How about that? But now that might be somebody that doesn't lose a leg. And that's somebody that may only have to pay $10 to interact with a physician and not 200 or 300 So as important as it is in the urban areas, and I, I live here, I just think about the people that are just like us, the same pale shade or dark shade of skin. They're our fellow citizens but they may not have that good job. They may not have that money, but they have real, real needs. 
So thank, thank you guys very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I appreciate someone who doesn't like to stand behind the mic, but we also want to make sure people can hear those sorts of passionate comments. So thanks for indulging us. Uh, our last speaker tonight is Greg Coltrane, who I met in Durham last year for the first time, um, doing great things with, uh, is it Tri-County? I always get confused. Okay, it was Tri-County before you started working with um, River Street Networks, which is out of Wilkes, but he's gonna get through all that. Um, Greg is the VP of Business Development for River Street Networks, and uh, what he's gonna talk about with what they're doing across North Carolina, I think is gonna blow many of your minds. So, come on up. Thank you, Chris. I um, have had a greater appreciation for groups like this because we like dealing with the grassroots efforts, the people in the community that are passionate, and uh, I really appreciate your comments. It really kind of draws in the main reason and the philanthropic approach to why we're really trying to have these types of conversations. Um, I was sitting there uh, just realizing how much has gone on in the last two years within our organization and how involved we've been in all the conversations that you've just heard. It's, it's been pretty amazing. Uh, but I wanted to try to give you a perspective of our vision and how we're trying to tailor a model that's built around a co-op uh, focus. Uh, and our original uh, creation of our co-op was to serve areas that nobody else wanted to serve. Uh, our co-op in particular is 67 years old. Uh, we started in Wilkes uh, County, uh, which is close to the mountains. Actually, we consider that county to be kind of the gateway to the mountains. And our goal back uh, 67 years ago was just to get phone service into people. And then later over time, we started moving towards data and broadband services. And uh, just a few short years ago, we successfully overbuilt our entire service area and we served 100% of our customers with fiber to the home in all the rural parts of Wilkes County. Uh, we, not too long ago, started a project to build fiber through the middle of Wilkes County. It's kind of like a donut to serve Wilkesboro. But after we got to look and we'd pretty much fulfilled the, the need and the demand for our membership. See, we're owned by our members. So everything that we make, we turn around and invest right back into the company. Uh, there's not a for-profit uh, group or shareholder uh, where we spread out all the revenues. So anytime we build something, if there's money that comes in off of it, we either pay it back in dividends to our members or we turn around and throw it back into capital investment. And so that's what we're excited about, and that's why we want to talk about the co-op approach. As we started looking at North Carolina, there were eight independent cooperatives in North Carolina, telephone cooperatives, but we kind of look at them like broadband cooperatives today because telephone is just really an app or a service that we provide. It's more about getting the broadband to the customer, or in our case, our member, our owner. And out of the eight co-ops, we were all kind of working to build fiber. Uh, the company I actually work for and have been with for 21 years until our merger this past August was called Tri-County Broadband. And we were one of those eight cooperatives, and we were located over on the eastern side of the state in that large circle called Beaufort County. We served three counties over there. And at the same time Wilkes was building all of their customers fiber, we were building past all of our members with fiber. And uh, Eric Kramer, our CEO, and I would sit down oftentimes and we would have this grandiose vision about how can we take our rural concept of building to the member and then take the monies that are made and build to more members and build to more members and more members until we accomplish the goal of getting to everybody. And, uh, and we felt like that that approach would be kind of like a three-legged bar stool. Uh, it, would, it would take the investment of multiple people at the table. So that meant immediately we kind of had to throw the model of it's our network out the window. And we would utilize other people's networks to help us. So when you think about a network, typically networks need to be built with a ring. And that ring is where you hang all the electronics off of. And then off of that ring, you run uh, into communities. Uh, and then off of that, you run out to the last customer. And so we were trying to accommodate how could we build a ring across the state. 
because all of a sudden, like overnight, it seems like, we went through multiple mergers and acquisitions. Uh, we've acquired over six, seven, seven companies uh, since 2014. So you can see that from that little green donut on the western side of the state, there's been a significant change in our, in our model. And that was to create jumping points across the state. So we bought little abandoned independent telephone cooperative or telephone companies that the companies really didn't want to do anything to help those people. And we bought them in an effort to begin to overbuild those areas with fiber so they can be our jump points, so that we could jump from the western side of the state, the central side of the state, southern central North Carolina, and the eastern side of the state and build out into rural areas. Using this model, we started talking to county government. We started talking to municipalities. And what we found out real quickly is all of them were engaged. All of them were at the table. And as Adam said earlier, there's laws and re restrictions and things that really make it complicated. And uh, so we reached out to our partners in the state and started with advocacy efforts to try to see if we could help make our legislators aware of the problems that were going on. Because if all of these people are at the table and they have assets that can help rural America, but there's a law that's preventing them from being able to lease that asset or go through a revenue share uh, a, um, partnership, then that creates a real big problem. And so we've been working aggressively on that, but we're talking and engaging all of these counties. And in the process of that, we were at a rural center meeting in Raleigh. Uh, where John was and several of his cohorts from his team. And sitting across the table from us as Eric and I were discussing our vision for growing and using the co-op approach um, was the North Carolina Electric Membership Cooperative Association. And some short time later, we were able to arrange a meeting that actually occurred at Roanoke Electric with Curtis Wynn and at that meeting was the CEO of North Carolina EMC and the CEO of our company. And we started discussing how can the TMCs and the EMCs and the counties and the municipalities all come together and share their assets, share their vision, bridge the gap with fixed wireless if that's what it takes, but ultimately work towards a fiber to the home solution. And out of that formed a relationship, a partnership, and somebody hijacked my presentation. Here we go. There's 26 independent electric telephone uh, membership cooperatives in North Carolina. There's eight TMCs. And the EMC Association recently, in the last few years, worked hard to procure fiber assets inside of the North Carolina EMC ring. So if you go back to what I was talking about earlier, where you have a ring and then you have spokes coming off of it and then you feed out to the end users, uh, we wanted to be able to have a partner that could help us connect peering points across the state. And they had an asset that they wanted to monetize, so we felt like that would help. And then the more we talked about it, we discussed the fact that the EMCs, as was already alluded to by a previous speaker, have fiber assets that they've built out to substations so that they can keep up with telemetry and electric use and load balancing and switching. So at certain times during the day, your electric cooperative will actually throw the load on their network to another peer point that's supplying them kilowatts of power at a cheaper rate so that it helps save their co-op members money. And so they're using all of this fiber to talk to these devices, but they had spare fibers that were sitting in there. And our goal was to be able to tap into that to get the middle mile so that when we get out to the communities that they're serving power, we can build off of that with what we call the last mile approach. So when you have three people who already have skin in the game and they've already built these networks, then you don't have one company having to come up with all the cost. It's a way to conquer this humongous hurdle. And so we've been working closely with them to, um, to create this partnership uh, called the Rural Broadband Network, it's RBN. Uh, that agreement is just a few weeks away from being in place. And we've already started on four pilot programs with four independent electric cooperatives in North Carolina to do exactly what I've just talked to you about. So this approach that Chris spoke on and the fact that we could actually maybe do this in seven years 
looks like it could be closer to a reality because we were thinking 20 years is a long time. There's kids that will come out of high school, graduate from college, start their families, start their careers, and be halfway through life by the time they have broadband. So what are they going to do? They're going to move. They're going to leave. The communities are shrinking. The school systems are shrinking. It's going to become a bigger, greater problem for our municipalities, our commissioners, our counties to fund water and sewer and all these things we're trying to do when people are moving away to the broadband areas. So it is a greater problem. Um, we are approaching this kind of in two ways. We're using fiber technology to get out to towers to do fixed wireless if we have to, but our long-term strategy and goal is to do fiber to every customer just because of the quality and the long-term resilience that we're going to have through that network. Um, we started engaging with several municipalities across the state. Recently, the uh, Land of Sky and Next Gen group out near Asheville uh, created a consortium uh, to basically seek a provider that would come in and talk with them about how to build broadband in those municipalities of Biltmore Forest and Hendersonville and Laurel Park. And so we're actively engaged as we won that RFP. And as I mentioned before, the counties, the counties, the counties, they're a major stakeholder. Many of them have assets that are usable, and we can piece these things together and create a puzzle in such a way that we can get out there and, and connect those customers at the last mile. And so I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to be here, and I look forward to any other additional questions I can answer during the panel. Thanks. I'd love to have the other panelists come up. We can bring the mic out. Um, I'll ask a quick question for uh, our panelists. Uh, you can spread out a little bit here. No, no, and actually, Greg, if you don't mind coming back a little bit, uh -oh. just you're going to be, there is a camera, there's a camera on you. You're all being recorded. So I want to be clear, um, you know, I think we've spent a lot of time demonstrating that there's a lot of things going on in North Carolina. We focused a lot on the rural areas. I'm curious if we can talk a little bit about areas in which there is cable access already and whether or not we see a need and, and what can be done in those areas where people do have some level of access, which I think will be common to people in this room. And so, Alan, I'd love to throw it to you first because I know that I can pick on you. Sure. Uh, when we decided to start our business, we decided to go into areas that had the worst broadband. or They didn't have broadband, right? They had DSL and satellite. So we avoided areas that had cable. Uh, to be quite honest, we weren't trying to go into Charlotte. We weren't trying to go into the Raleigh. Uh, we were trying to go into more of the rural areas. Uh, though we got brought into cable areas just through customer demand. We had people asking us, well, hey, can you serve us? And it's like, well, you have access to cable. Why would you want us? And they're like, well, we want an alternative, and we're not really happy with what we have. So uh, that's how we got started in some of the more urban areas. Uh, but I think it comes back to competition. Even if cable is available, people want to have a choice. You want to have a choice of a better service experience. Um, with fixed wireless, which several of us are involved in, you can do symmetrical service, so your speeds are the same upload as download, which cable doesn't do and, and DSL doesn't do. So there's an advantage to, uh, to that as well. So we've been successful against it. I'll add to that, too. In addition to competition, it's recognizing what you've got when you've got it. So, I mean... Wilkes Communications is one of the, the, the premier folks in the, in the country um, and certainly the state. And there's other areas, too. So um, my, the president of the Rural Center is from Piney Creek, North Carolina, and Allegheny County, served by a partner group, uh, Skyline Skybest. Well, we go into a lot of the areas like that that have been served for a long time, and it might be sort of like the folks in the Dakotas. You ask them, well, how are you seizing upon this for economic development purposes? Are you, are you recruiting businesses with it? Are you, are you getting folks in the area? And they sort of give a blank stare. And you're like, people across the state would give their eye teeth for what you have. <laughs> and, and a lot of the folks that have had it for a while don't necessarily know what they've got. So it's, it's a combination of you know, when you actually have it making sure that everyone in your community knows what a blessing that is and is seizing upon it and talking about it and celebrating that fact and using it to their greatest advantage. Mm -hmm. Great. Is there anything else that you want to... And, and the issue of people that have some level of service today, I just want to make sure that we cover that base. Well, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not going to jump ahead, but I did want to say that I think it's important that we don't try to duplicate 
uh, things that are already being done. If there are areas where service is being provided and it's a reasonable broadband connection, um, those people have service. So if we spend money to go there and try to replicate and really create competition right now, while there's some people just two miles away that have nothing at all, that doesn't seem like we're focusing in the right direction right now. There will become time for competition. The, the goal right now in the sense of urgency is to get to the people who don't have anything at all. And so when we look at our co-op and we look at what our members have that they probably are starting to take for granted, uh, we want to take that and step out into those rural areas and not necessarily go and compete head-to-head -head with a provider that's already providing gigabit service to their customers. So you would, when you ended there, you mentioned gigabit. So you would say that if you're talking about areas, uh, we may have a population center in a rural region where they have a slow DSL, you would not consider that to be served then? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not at all. We're talking a fiber network. and and definitely something that meets the federal guidelines right now of 25 and 3. And I try not to get too technical into that because at the end of the day, it's not really about the speed. It's more about the technology that's going to be able to grow and offer um, the people that live there whatever they need 25, 50 years from now. And that's the goal. And Jeff, I want to give you a, a specific question. Um, you know, you're a person that's in this for passion. Um, you know, you're, it's, it's pretty clear. <laughs> and so I'm curious how you, um, when you're looking at this, when we look at an area like Fuquay, Fuquay, Verena, the maps would probably tell us that a lot of people have pretty good service and that we probably don't need to do much here. How do you react to that based on our limited information that we have? I think that what happens is what uh, was alluded to earlier, and that's the role of government uh, and government is a champion for its citizens uh, because generally the members of the government, whether they're elected or they're, you know, paid staff, they're citizens as well. So they understand more than anyone what the issues are that face a community. And I think that if you look at like a Fuquay Verena, for example, you look at the opportunities to say we want to keep what we have in terms of this quality of life and these capabilities, but we also don't want to risk losing what we have. I, and, and I'll give you a very concrete example. Uh, there's some communities that we deal with in central North Carolina that are in the area of some of our consulting clients. And they, their providers, which were large companies, provide them with reasonable service. But as our country tends toward deregulation of some of those types of services, what we found is that, and a great example I have is a private school, and they called our client, and they said, can you do anything for us because our carrier came to us and we're getting T1 service now, which is okay. Uh, and so they want to sign us up on their fiber service, and because they consider us a business or an institution, our construction costs are $17,000, and it was going to be a little over $3,000 a month for 50 meg service. So even though there was quote-unquote good service in that arena, you found the incumbent carriers who were measuring themselves way down the line here on the bottom line and return on investment, making certain decisions that did not take into account the human beings that live in that community. And I think that's where this issue really comes to the forefront. Mm -hmm. well, I'd like to bring people up to the microphones. Just for those in the audience who don't know what T1 is, how oh. much T1 is 1.54 megabits per second. And does everybody understand megabits? Because <laughs> you'll hear me say, oh, it's, it's a gig and it's this and that. So a bit is eight digits that are ones or zeros. It's digital, it's on or off. A character roughly is eight bits. So my name is 32 bits. So if you think about transmitting my name through networks, then it's got to move. 32 megabits over a period of time. So if you think about what Alan and Greg do, and they're streaming or they're bringing homework capabilities to our children or they're doing real time with, with telemedicine, and it's non-interlaced, so they got a screen and it's going from this side to this side and all the way down at a high speed for ones and zeros, everything is a one and a zero. 
So it's under, important to understand when you hear about 25 megabits, that's about 8 million characters of information per second. So you think about full video versus the old days of dial-up. Did that help? Did that help? I think or did I'm, I answer I'm sure totally wrong. some folks. I'm sorry, I might have gotten a little wonky there. I apologize. So um, we'll have the question. Would you mind coming up to the microphone so we can have it recorded for all time <laughs> in digital um, ones, and zeros. ones and zeros? You, uh, I'm Bob Smith, manager, commission, and you mentioned obliquely uh, MCNC. Hmm. MCNC, as you know, has uh, an oval that runs from the coast all the way to the west, up through the north and down to the south. I'm not trying to sell them, but I was just wondering, since they serve all the schools now, uh, have you sought to see if there's any excess capability there? Let, let me address that. So my company helped design a good part of the MCNC network before I got here. And um, we actually have the exclusive responsibility for marketing MCNC capabilities to other carriers for usage. And the current folks at MCNC are actually increasingly aware of the requirements for use of their network. Uh, Tommy Jacobson and some of the other folks over there, if, as late as last week, we're having some very specific information on opening up the networks. But I think you guys are working with them, and you guys are mm -hmm. working with them as well. So, Yeah, so I mean, it's. It, our state is very, very fortunate to have had this network built. Uh, it really occurred at a very unique, opportune time for companies like ourselves, who are small operators, to be able to ride a network across the state to get to another county or an adjacent region. So they, they've been crucial and they are very much engaged and at the table. Um, matter of fact, they had representation at our town hall last night. So. Yeah, it's, it's really worth praising MCNC. There's a number of states that have had, all states have similar needs for connecting key anchor institutions. Some of them have just paid a, a company like AT&T year after year, which is fine to meet those services, but at the end of the day, if they don't make the next payment, they don't have anything. MCNC is an enduring institution because of the way it was created. If I can make a policy appeal. Uh, for a carrier to go into a uh, rural area and be profitable, we need to get as much business as we can uh, to offset the cost. If the large anchor institutions were cherry-picked by one provider and the next provider that's going in is just left with residential service, it's really hard to make a business case. So if you are talking to somebody about who wants to cherry-pick the largest accounts in your town or your county, I think you should ask them to also serve the residents. If you allow them just to cherry pick, it's going to hurt anybody else, any of us who are trying to go in after the fact and offer a residential service. Right. Uh, that's, let me, let me, that's a very important trade off. And I'll just say that a lot of people think that there's one answer that's correct for how to handle that difficulty. And there's not one answer. It's a trade off that one has to weigh. I was going to make a point because in Stanley County, uh, Stanley County has been a long time client of my company. But I'm also, obviously, growing up there, I'm very familiar with the, the geography. And one of the things that Alan did was he went and he looked at areas that were totally unserved by Windstream because uh, that's the incumbent. CenturyLink has a part of the county. And as opposed to cherry picking, what he committed to uh, Andy was, uh, yes, we'll serve Norwood and areas around Norwood. We'll serve areas up towards what they call the Tuckertown area, not just because there are towers there, but he designed his network to specifically provide access to those parts of the community that really were underserved and also economically, because I know that area, economically were kind of on the ragged edge. He didn't just concentrate on Albemarle and Locust areas that tend to be toward fast growing Charlotte. No, I'd love to invite other people up to the microphone. Um, I'd like to um, ask, please come on up. Yeah, I'm gonna throw a blue sky one at you. Is this working? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I'm Deborah Watts, and I'm on the board for the NC Hearts Gigabit, and I've spent 20 years working around North Carolina and other parts of the country with a focus on what do you do with broadband once you get it. So I'm not, I'm not the tech geek that does the networks and the data centers and all that, but it's once it's there, how do you use it for economic development? What, how do you make the most of it, to John's point? And my blue sky vision would be to have the state take a more proactive role in being part of the solution instead of just being a hurdle. 
and it strikes me that North Carolina has an extraordinarily high credit rating. And why can't we take bonds and solve some of this problem, create a fund that people could compete for, a great grant really made great, you know, that's funded by the people of North Carolina, and they would be the ones benefiting from it, and the return on investment would be lower. We could have that 20-year horizon that makes the co-op model so attractive and, and functional. So I'd like to throw it to each of you to, what's your blue sky model? You know, if you could be ruler for the day, in this case all kings, um, what would you do to solve the problem or to try and make the, to encourage the state to be, the state government and the legislature in particular, to have a, a longer, broader vision for their role and, and being more active in this. And you know, maybe what you'll say will give us some idea for our advocates, to some new ideas to go in and start pushing on them with. That's a, it's a terrific question, Deborah, and I also just want to thank you for the suggestions you gave us as we were organizing this. We very much appreciate your input along the way. So if I bought you guys some time to think about that, I'm hoping for some really good answers. <laughs> well, I was just sitting here thinking about the grassroots approach that I mentioned earlier. Um, what you guys have been able to accomplish through your grassroots efforts and your voice in bringing forums together like this is the starting point but it needs to be championed much further. So my blue sky approach would be that all of the counties in North Carolina, all of them, all from a county level, would form broadband subcommittees. Um, they would be anchor people in that institution. They would be um, maybe doctor or a local bakery person, uh, someone that runs a daycare center. Uh, people that have uh, educational involvement, uh, maybe somebody who serves in an IT arena, and those people get together collectively and discuss how can we work as a subcommittee for our county commission or for our town council, and how can we bring people to the table like a, a open broadband or River Street Networks or a TANG or some, uh, some I said it wrong, didn't I? Ting, sorry. Oh, yeah. I apologize. Tang is the stuff I really, really like. I really liked it when I was a kid. That's why I said that. But, but, but I think it's important to have those conversations, to have these meetings, uh, to share uh, the room of experts, pass out actual exchange phone numbers, email addresses, don't try to reinvent the wheel, uh, and, and have those serious conversations. I think it's really important. And I applaud all the counties that we walk into that already have a broadband subcommittee. They really seem to have their act together. That's great. Uh, and they've actually done like a, a broadband uh, study or they've, they've focused on those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think there's some really great ideas out there for blue sky, big picture thinking, what you just suggested. I mean, it, this is an expensive proposition, so finding some big funding mechanisms for it sounds wonderful. There's been, I've heard ideas of a, a statewide rural cooperative that, that would help serve some of the underserved areas. At the same time, though, even under the current situations, I have seen that when people come together, magic can happen. There's the folks out in eastern North Carolina and Pink Hill that just got fed up with the fact that they couldn't get broadband, got together and started Eastern Carolina Broadband and are serving people under the same, under the existing conditions. River Street Networks is going all over the state under the existing conditions and serving a lot more people than they were just four years ago. So I think what I would say is, is and this might get it even more than broadband, is if we can start looking beyond some of the artificial lines we've drawn. Um, municipalities, uh, a lot of the folks that are serving them are, are serving that because there's an arbitrary line drawn. Counties, the same way. And sometimes it's really hard for us to look beyond those artificial barriers and work together because this isn't a problem that just fits any sort of particular line. Um, and. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Jeff has been involved in this, but in those areas where people have been able to think regionally, Albemarle con Commission commissioned a region-wide study to figure out exactly where broadband was, where the service was provided, what was missing, and how that matched to population and to businesses. And because they were able to invest that as a region, they're now seeing an influx of capital. Um, Eastern Shore Communications came in and won a $1.8 million grant to serve Camden County, which is one of the most underserved areas of the state. And 
there are hurdles and there are roadblocks, and I would love to see lots and lots of money funded for this. But even under the current conditions, even a bluer sky model for me would be if we can figure out ways of working together um, across the lines that we've drawn, whether that's you know geographically or sector, to really get things done because I think it's, it's very possible and it can happen quickly. So we've had two answers that kind of dodge the, the core of the question. They're both very good answers. And I appreciate that. I want, to, I want to call light to that because we've seen states that try to put money aside and if people are not organized locally, mm -hmm. that money may not be spent yeah. wisely. But I want to put a little pressure on Alan and Jeff. <laughs> what would you do that actually only the state could do that, that would um, improve access? I've got two things. Yeah, I'll great. Jeff chime in. Uh, the restriction of municipalities from offering their own internet to their citizens is, to me, makes no sense. Uh, you should have as much competition as possible. If the carriers won't do the job, then local community wants to. Local self-choice, uh, I think they should have the ability to do like a Wilson. Uh, just my own opinion, but I think that would be helpful, more competition. Uh, second if, thing... Sorry, just one second. If you're interested in that, the Coalition for Local Internet Choice has a chapter in North Carolina. Highly recommend looking it up. Catherine Rice does a lot of the work. It's a, it's a very good organization with resources, and I'm sure you're involved as well. You're in, yep. And see where it's yeah. it. Yeah. Alan's required to be involved with everything. <laughs> uh, the second thing I would do is you mentioned the GREAT program. For anyone in the room who's not familiar with the GREAT program, the state has set aside $10 million this year in the budget to help fund uh, broadband. One of the requirements is in order to be eligible area, uh, that area cannot have accepted CAF uh, funding, which is the federal funding, at a 10 by 1 megabit service. So uh, it's kind of a roundabout way of saying it. If a CenturyLink or some other provider said that they were going to take government money and offer 10 megabit service in an area, then the other carriers couldn't access the grant. I think we need to demand better, right? Let's not settle for 10 by 1. Right? Maybe we shouldn't even settle for 25 by 3. Maybe we should settle for gigabit may be impossible for everybody, but that should be the goal. Everybody should try to get there. Let's stop taking 10 by 1 as an acceptable answer. Let's stop giving money to people that are rolling out 10 by 1 in today's world. Mm -hmm. uh, let's make those areas eligible for other carriers to offer faster speeds. Terrific. And just to be clear, he's talking about a Federal Communications Commission program. So if you want to tell your senators or U.S. reps to, to look at that, that's who you would contact about that. Right, right. Um, so with all these answers in front of me and pressure coming from here and pressure from a certain side of the audience over there to my left and her right, um, I'm not sure that King Jeff has a great blue sky perspective. I think I would, would echo what these guys have said about removing artificial barriers, especially think in terms of wireless capabilities, not only the existing technology, but what I referred to earlier that's coming out of Eight Rivers and Durham. Uh, many of our municipalities and county units uh, are still thinking in terms of the world of cable franchisees. And you have a certain area in which you can deploy infrastructure. And I think that, as you guys have discussed, those barriers are artificial. And the artificiality, I think I got that word right, is when you think about radio waves, RF, and you think about light waves, they don't care where your town boundary is. They just don't care. And I'll, I'll give you a, a very concrete example and refer to my friend, our friend Curtis Wynn again. Uh, we, did, uh, we did a study for him a few years ago and he said, I'm, he was half joking, uh, but he said, I'm really concerned that if I got this broadband thing wrong, it would cost me my job. So we put up our, our assessment across his region, and 40% uh, of the responses came from areas that were not in their service territory. Over 90% said, I want it like right now. And let me tell you what 90% was. 90% was out of more than 10,000 responses. He said, well, if I don't do this, I'm going to lose my job. So then you think about where your infrastructure goes. So he has infrastructure on what the co-op owns, but now you come to a Husky, for example, where Dominion owns the poles. So they control the pole rights. You get to some other places where it's an electricity. They may have some constraints. 
So where it's possible to cost effectively work to that three-legged point of building fiber, high performance fixed wireless, whatever, there's a way to get around these artificial barriers. The key thing is figuring out, I think, in my opinion, pushing, pushing, pushing to get rid of those barriers. Because I think when those barriers fall away, the last thing you'll have to worry about is the incumbents trying to say no. And I worked for an incumbent for six years. I know how they say no. So I think if you talk about the blue sky, I don't know how you do this because I don't understand politics. My wife tells me what to think, so that's good because she's smarter than I am. But it seems like to me that a lot of people can say no, and it's how do you get people to say yes to what's the right thing for each of us to do. We have time for one final comment. I'm sorry that we had, I let the agenda run a little wild, um, but I want to take a final question. I, I guess it's this policy conversation that I want more of, and we won't get it tonight, but it keeps getting back to the state legislature um, and the barriers that they've created, and yet their constituents are here um, and around the state saying we need broadband. Um, in the last session, uh, you know, as we were just organizing, um, we got the great grant, but we also got some really crappy language in the budget law that basically puts cities into a fear mode if there's any element of their facilities with they're trying to contribute to a, a project to get internet in that might be subsidizing a competitive service. Um, so I guess what I want to know is, does it help to go and talk to your state legislature? Does it help to go tell them the story so that when those votes come up, they're going to think twice? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let me ask. Let yeah. me ask Aaron here, just out of curiosity. Does this ten phone calls light a fire um, to a single rep? You know, what does it take? Ten is a lot, right? That would be a lot. Sometimes it's just one. So sometimes one or two, and and, and you're and you're Min and you're uh, not Minnesota. You're North Carolina. <laughs> you can call people in Minnesota. We're real nice. We answer the phone. Um, but um, you want to call your North Carolina reps. You want to tell your family in other counties and other uh, jurisdictions to call their reps because a few calls does make a difference. They know that for every call, there's several people not calling. Sure, but please do it at the microphone. I'm, I'm Hugh Johnson with the County Commission Association, and I just wanted to say, John asked at the beginning how many of you were elected officials, and to build on what Aaron said, if you are elected official, even more so calling a fellow elected official who is willing to put your name on the ballot and run for office, that carries weight at the legislature um, as well, and sometimes even more so. I'll, I'll take a second for sort of a shameless plug. There's a flyer up here for Rural Day, um, which is our advocacy day at the General Assembly. And even if you don't live in one of those 80 counties, we love everybody at Rural Day. And broadband is the number one advocacy priority for us. So the day is going to feature um, governor and lieutenant governor are both confirmed. We're going to have lots of state leaders and people from out of state coming and talking about this and other things. We're ending the day this time with rather than asking people to go and schedule a one on one meeting or make one phone call to a legislator, we're doing regional roundtables with legislators. So we would invite you all to come and be a part of that and have a uh, productive, interesting, innovative dialogue with people because then it's a room of a hundred people at one time talking with a whole group of legislators saying this is important to me. So we'd love to have you there or have you spread the word about making sure that we have a, a strong voice for broadband at that conversation. So, well, sorry, Tuesday, March 26th at the Raleigh Convention Center. Uh, if there's any last brief comments, I want to honor you all that made your time to come out tonight. I very much appreciate that. Um, Please. Yeah, uh, I wanted to uh, thank you for going to Senator Grove. I had to move up from Senator Grove. Uh, so this is not a question, just a comment. Five years ago, I lived there with my wife, who had a business uh, as an architect, and her competition came from somewhere in Yugoslavia. After the war, they were able to rebuild, and their engineers were competing with her. Her way to get data to her customers was to put on a disk, drive somewhere out there, recognize one change, come home, two hours later, make another change, on a disk, drive back, while somebody in Yugoslavia with a goat riding on the treadmill had a more reliable internet <laughs> to send their data to her, to, to her customers in this state. So if, if you're talking about necessity for broadband, if you talk about 
you know, how it changes communities. I mean, we moved out because we had five telephone lines, $70 each, just to have enough speed for her, for her to attach to an AutoCAD server. This is preposterous. This is 20 minutes away from headquarters of AT&T, Verizon, IBM, GlaxoSmithKline, 20 minutes away. Just a comment. Thank you for that. Oh, I'm Adam Kempinski from X Cedar Grove. <laughs> well, three months from now, you can move back and you'll have broadband. <laughs> but he won't pay your closing costs, just so you know. <laughs> So I'd like to, to wrap up tonight. I really appreciate you all coming out. I hope that this helps. We're hoping that you'll be inspired to um, you know, perhaps get involved forming a committee, to at least know that if you have more questions, any of us are happy to ha answer them. I uh, firmly believe that if you have the energy, we can provide answers to the questions that will develop. So we're hoping that that's what this will inspire. I very much want to thank Ting for making this possible and for um, investing in these fiber networks um, around the country, but especially here in North Carolina. Um, I'd like to thank the, League of, the North Carolina League of Municipalities for doing such a good, great job, and um, Katie for helping to organize the event on my staff. Um, I really want to thank um, everyone that was involved with this, and please join me in thanking the panel for coming out.